Bill Robertson, a local author, and have written a 10 novel series on the Bucktails, along with my friend David Reimer, who helped, helped me to co-write the series. And in our books, we talk about two boys from Smithport who run off and join the Bucktails and give all the adventures and everything that happens to them. The Bucktails are really important for our area because the birthplace of the Bucktails is over in Smithport. And again, as I mentioned, the books that I wrote involve two young boys who actually muster in in Smithport and uh, go off to war. In April of 1861, April 14th to be exact, Fort Sumter was fired on by the rebels, which started the American, uh, American Civil War. As soon as the rebels fired on Fort Sumter, President Lincoln put out a call for 75,000 volunteers to step up, step up and fight the rebel menace. The first man in Pennsylvania to answer Lincoln's call was Thomas L. Kane. Kane was a Philadelphia lawyer, but he'd been involved in a lot of important causes before the Civil War began. He was an abolitionist and also helped the Mormons who could have gotten massacred by the American army had Cain not intervened in their, in their behalf. Also after the Civil War, Colonel Cain built the famous Kinzu Viaduct so he could take coal from his, his coal mines here in McKean County up to the Buffalo Market. Also, another thing that Cain did was form the town of Cain. He's the man that organized and created the town of Cain. As soon as Cain heard that he needed, a, you know, some volunteers to help help Lincoln, he got on his horse, Old Glencoe, and rode from Philadelphia up here to McKean County, where he had land holdings, and he went over to Smithport, which was the county seat then too, and started sending out all these handbills that he posted around the county asking for volunteers. And this is an actual picture of the handbill that he put out. And as it reads, Volunteer Rifles Marksman Wanted. By authority of Governor Curtin, the company will be formed this week of citizens of McKean, Elk, and Cameron counties who are prepared to take up arms immediately to support the Constitution of the United States and defend the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. I am authorized to accept at once for service any man who will bring in with him to my headquarters a rifle which he knows how to use. Come forward, Americans, they are not degenerate with the spirit of 76. Come forward in time to save the city of Washington from capture. In time to save the flag of the Union. They are being humbled as it has been at Fort Sumter. Signed, Thomas L. Kane. Kane set up his headquarters at the Bennett House Hotel over in Smithport, which is where the Angel Court Restaurant is today. And he had men from all over McKean County come and sign up for his new company of marksmen, of riflemen, of men who knew how to shoot well, because he wanted to organize a rifle regiment, marksmen, who would be like the special forces are today, the special service groups of today. And so the first man who entered his headquarters and signed the muster roll by putting an X on the sheet because he didn't know how to sign his name was James Landrigan. And after Landrigan signed the muster roll, he walked across the street and saw a deer hanging in a meat market. And he went on a lark and cut the tail off the, off the deer and stuck it in his hat and walked out of the meat market with his tail on his hat. And Colonel Kane happened to see him do it and thought, man, that's the perfect symbol for my group of riflemen. And so that's how the Bucktails actually, you know, came about sort of by accident. Once uh, Kane had a hundred hardy men signed up for his new company, he marched across country down to Cameron County, down to Emporium, where another group of hardy woodsmen joined him. And then these two groups then marched downstream 
down to Driftwood, where a group of men from Elk County also joined up with the Bucktails. There, there wasn't any railroad or any roads in that area. So the only way that they could actually make it downstream, down to Camp Curtin in Harrisburg, was to build rafts. And these men were lumbermen, loggers, trappers, hunters, farmers, they were all hardy men, so it was no problem for them to build these rafts. They built four rafts all together, and one of the rafts even had a corral so that Colonel Kane could take old Glencoe down with them. And they even had outhouses on the rafts. You know, they had to be prepared. And then they started floating down the Cinnamahoning River. And they got down to a place called Rattlesnake Falls and they had to stop there because otherwise the raft would have plunged over the falls and been broken to pieces. Then they marched from there down to Lock Haven where they caught the train which took them down to Camp Curtin down in Harrisburg. Yeah, the men had taken with them to Camp Curtin their own personal rifles, their hunting rifles. When they got down there, they had to trade those in and actually send them home, and then they were uh, given rifles by the, by the Army. And by the way, they were part of the uh, Pennsylvania Reserve Corps because uh, Andrew Curtin, the governor of Pennsylvania, was afraid the rebels would invade the state of Pennsylvania, and so he formed his own private army to protect our borders. And again, these guys were known as the Pennsylvania Reserves. And the Bucktails then became the 13th Pennsylvania Reserves. That was the name of their particular regiment. Also, they became known as the Kane Rifles, being that Thomas Kane organized them. And also, they were called the 1st Pennsylvania Rifles. And then later, after they got absorbed by the Federal Army, they were known as the 42nd Pennsylvania Volunteers. So all those names, if you hear any of those names, are referring to the Bucktails. Also, the Bucktails were issued the equipment that they needed to be soldiers in the Pennsylvania Reserve Corps. And first of all, they were naturally, being that all of the uh, battles were fought during the summer, in the heat of summer, they naturally gave them nice, comfortable clothes, like a nice pair of heavy wool pants to wear in the summer. And of course, to stay cool on a 90 degree day, they got this blue sack coat. It was also made of heavy wool. And by the way, the Bucktails had to march overnight on a 92 degree night just to get to Gettysburg on the second day, and then they fought the, the battle after that. Because, you know, the guys were wearing this heavy wool, you could smell an army like a half mile before you saw them because they would sweat so bad and they, they didn't really clean their uniforms that often. They didn't bathe very often. Oftentimes they, you know, would end up with lice. And they'd always say if they had lice on themselves, they were flying the black flag. They had all these lice crawling on them. Also, besides the, the sack coat and the heavy wool pants, and by the way, you'd have to button all these buttons all the way up to your neck to be in regulation. If you didn't do that, the officers would jump on you. So you can imagine there'd be no air coming in if you couldn't even unbutton your neck which would make it even hotter for the poor soldiers. A lot of times these guys would march 25 miles and then fight a battle in these heavy wool clothes. Also too, they got one thing that they could actually choose their own hat. And there are three different styles of hat that were in vogue in the Civil War. The most common hat was known as the Kepi cap. And being these guys were bucktails, they sewed a bucktail on the side of the hat, which was their, again, their symbol for their regiment. And also, if you look at the top of the hat, you'll see some other symbols that are there. The bugle tells you that the bucktails were part of the infantry, the guys who marched from place to place to fight. The 13 tells you which regiment they belong to, the 13th uh, Pennsylvania Reserves, and the I tells you which company that they belong to. And I represents I of McKean County. So again, just by looking at the top of the guy's hat, you could tell which branch of service he belonged to, which regiment he belonged to, and which company he was part of. And if you were a cavalry guy, instead of a bugle on your hat, you would have cross swords. 
if you were an artillery guy, you'd have a little cannon barrel there. So again, by looking at the top of the hat, you can tell which branch of the service the guy belonged to. Another type of hat you could choose was the forage cap. And this thing sat way, way up on top of your head, and I thought it would make a better target, make, make it into a better target, so I never chose to wear this hat. But they call it the forage hat because a lot of times the guys wouldn't uh, have enough food, they'd run out of food, so they'd have to go out into the fields and forage for whatever they could get. And this made like a good bucket if you wanted to pick apples from a tree or you know, get some peaches off a tree or steal some eggs from a farmer's hen house. So again, that's the reason they call it a forage cap because it also made a nice little bucket for when you're foraging. The other cap, which I prefer myself, is the slouch hat, the felt slouch hat. And again, notice I have a bucktail on there, being that I'm a bucktail guy. And I like this one because it keeps the sun off you better, keeps the rain from dripping down your neck. It's, you know, just better for a weather hat more than anything else. He also, the bucktails were given a haversack. And a haversack was used to uh, carry their food. And some of the haversacks that were just made out of canvas like this one, and other haversacks were made out of leather. But the ones that were made out of leather got nasty inside pretty fast because they didn't breathe. And so after a while, your food would rot in there and make the whole thing stink bad. So I chose to use this one because it breathes. And the Bucktails, like all the other uh, Union soldiers, had three basic food groups. First of all, they had hardtack biscuits. They were just a square biscuit made out of flour and water. And these things got so hard that they eventually the soldiers would call them teeth dullers because they were so hard to bite into. They would sometimes bend your teeth or break your teeth trying to eat the dumb thing. So usually they had to soak them in water or something to get them soft enough to eat. Also, they called them Lincoln pie. You know, Lincoln was in the in the White House having a nice piece of apple pie. They were eating this, these crummy hardtack biscuits. Also, they call them sheet iron crackers because they were so hard to eat. The second major food group that they had was a lot of uh, salt meat. And the salt meat was stored in casks, barrels, with salt water that surrounded the, uh, the meat. And if the meat would peek up out of that water, if the water would go down below the meat, the meat would turn green. And they would issue that to the soldiers, and the soldiers either had the option of pitching it in the bushes or burning it black over an open fire and eating it anyway. So again, and the soldiers had some colorful names for the meat too. Salt horse, for example, was one of their favorite names for the forum. The third major food group was also uh, coffee. And they needed coffee because they needed the caffeine to keep them going when they're on a long march. And the coffee was really important too because if you boil the water that you use, you kill all the germs in the water. And unfortunately, in the Civil War, they didn't know germs existed. So if they went to a stream along the way and there was a dead animal in the stream above them, they still got water out of it, but sometimes they get sick from that water. As a matter of fact, they would get dysentery and they get a severe case of diarrhea that would kill them. And 63% of all Union soldiers who died in the Civil War died from disease. That was a number one killer. 19% died of battle wounds or battle shots, and then 12 more percent died of wounds after they were treated by the doctors, they would die from complication. So again, 63% of all Union soldiers died from disease in the Civil War. All right, the Bucktails also had kind of another special uh, dish that they made. It was called Skilly Glee. They would take the, the uh, hard tack and soak it in water, and then they would fry it in, in pork fat and eat that. And that was a big treat to them, believe it or not. Ugh. Can't imagine myself. See, also the Bucktails were issued a canteen. And the standard canteen for the Union soldiers had a, a blue uh, wool case over it 
but unfortunately, I lost my uh, my canteen and had to take one off a dead rub, so I had to sell for one that had a gray case on it. And these were just standard canteens; they had a cork stopper. And every time that you know they would stop near a stream or something, they made sure to fill it up. And some guys would even put coffee in it, you know, so again it would help them on the march, keep them awake while they're marching along. Okay, also the bucktails were issued one of these Union belts, and they had a U.S. belt buckle on the front of it. And some guys would polish this to a high sheen, but I figured if I did that, that would make me a better target too. So I just let mine kind of curled up a little bit, so I wasn't so visible in the woods. Put this on for you, so you'll see exactly what they had to carry through the woods with them when they're out hiking around. All right, the next thing that the bucktails were given was one of these little cap boxes. And the cap box contained these little brass caps. And you used these to help fire your gun. And I'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> Another device you had to have in order to fire your gun was the cartridge box. And the cartridge box carried 40 rounds of ammunition in it. And the bucktails were so confident that they said they carried 40 dead men in their cartridge box. They figured every time they shot, they'd shoot a rev and kill them. And also, too, the bucktails were given one of these bayonets. And the bayonet, as you can see, was pointed, but generally speaking, they didn't really use these much in combat. Instead, they used them like they made it a handy candle holder. They stick it through and put a candle on there so they could read in their tent at night. They sometimes use them to, as tent pegs to hold up their tent, but very seldom did they get into big battles where they stab people with these bayonets. they had to use whatever they had at home to fight with. Sometimes they carried their squirrel rifles with them or you know the guns they had at home but they couldn't find others. And also they, a lot of them had these big bowie knives that they used instead of a bayonet. And they actually did use these to fight with. If they got in the corner someplace they would, they would stab you with these for sure. You know I'd like to talk about the weapons that the bucktails used while they were in combat. The first guns that the Bucktails were issued were Harper Ferry's muskets. These were smooth bore muskets that weren't accurate up to very far. And so in order to uh, make the, the best of these weapons, they load them with a round ball, which was a 69 caliber ball, a great big thing like a pumpkin ball. Then they would put three buckshot in with it. You know, they used bucking ball loads because they thought, you know, maybe they hit, hit a rev somehow one of these projectiles. And Bucktails naturally had to, you know, come up with their own name for this. They called it Three Cheers and a Tiger. They'd be shooting out of their guns. But luckily, they only carried them on one small scouting mission. And when they got back to Camp Curtin, then they were uh, issued these rifles here. And they either, either were given a Springfield with just this or an Enfield rifle. And they shot a 58 caliber mini ball. And a mini ball <clears throat> is a bullet like this, it's a 58 caliber that has a hollow base. So when that ball hit an arm or leg, it shattered the bone in the arm or the leg. And so if you got hit like that, after the battle, the surgeon would either have to cut off your arm or cut off your leg. 
And after every battle outside the surgery tent, you see mountains of arms and legs laying there because of the damage these bullets did. And the Springfield and Enfield guns were muzzle loaders, meaning that you loaded them down the barrel. And usually your, your uh, mini ball came wrapped up in a paper cartridge, which meant that the, the bullet and the powder were all in the same, you know, the same pack. And you carried 40 of those in your cartridge box. In order to load your gun, you had to bite the end off of the paper cartridge, dump the powder down the barrel. And by the way, a lot of guys who had no teeth were exempt from service because they couldn't do that simple function. And so they said, well, you, you can't fight in the battle because you can't bite the end off of your paper cartridge and we don't want you. All right, then you would take your mini ball and put it base first, put it in the barrel. Then you would take out your ramrod, ram the bullet down the barrel like that to seat it. Then you would replace your ramrod so you had it for the next time. That's very important. Then you'd have to pick up your gun, <clears throat> cock your hammer on half cock. Then you would take one of these caps that I told, talked about before, the little metal caps, brass caps. Put that on the nipple. Then you would pull your gun to full cock, raise the gun and shoot. And the bucktails could do this three times a minute if you're a practice soldier. Load and fire your gun three times a minute. I don't think I could load and fire one time in five minutes, but you know that's how practiced they became. And these guns were accurate to 700 yards. They had a rifle barrel, and they were you know really they were great guns. And the Bucktails, you know, being the sharpshooters of the uh, Pennsylvania Reserve Corps, were really good with these guns. Yeah, a lot of times the guys would get rattled in the middle of a battle and because of the battle noise they didn't realize that their gun didn't go off and so they keep putting more and more shells into their gun until the whole barrel was full with, filled with ammunition especially green troops that didn't know any better and then their gun was useless also too sometimes they would put the, the ramrod down the barrel and forget that it was there and they'd shoot and the ramrod would fly across the battlefield like a spear at the enemy and then they were sunk because Again, if they didn't have a ramrod, they couldn't load their guns. So there's a lot of things in the heat of battle that, that could happen to you, especially if you're a green troop. Okay, the next gun the Bucktails were issued was a step up. And this was the Sharps rifle that they were given. And the Sharps was a breech loader, meaning that you loaded it from the back. And this, this gun fired up. 52 caliber paper cartridge. And what you did is you flip the lever of your gun, or lever action. When you did, the breech popped open. Then you would insert your bullet and the paper, paper cartridge into the gun, and the powder was in the paper cartridge. And when you flip the lever up, a blade came down and cut off the paper cartridge and exposed the powder. Then in order to ignite the powder, Again, you cocked your gun, took out one of these caps, put it on the nipple, and fired. And by using this type of gun, you didn't have to expose yourself to fire because you weren't like taking a ramrod and standing up and loading the gun or you know moving your arm back and forth to load the gun. So you were able to preserve yourself a little better during battle, you could stay hidden more. And also you could fire 10 shots a minute using this particular gun. And so that really helped you out too. It helped add to the firepower of, of your group. And these guns, the Bucktails carried from the, just before the Battle of Antietam all the way through to the Wilderness Campaign. And these were, you know, again, they made them into you know, a much more powerful unit because the guns were, you're able to fire them faster and it, you know, you didn't expose your men to enemy fire so much. Just before the Wilderness Campaign, the Bucktails were issued the Spencer rifle. 
And this actually is a Civil War gun. The other two I showed you were re reproductions. This actually was used in the Civil War. And this is the carbine that probably cavalry used, where the Bucktails would have had the dispenser rifle, which would be longer. This gun is like actually a modern rifle because it fired a 52 caliber rimfire cartridge, much like a big 22 cartridge. And the way you loaded it was there was a magazine in the stock. And you flip the lever on the magazine, pull out the magazine, stick ten sh or seven shells down the stock, flip the magazine down in there. And then when you flip the lever, the shell would pop up, close the lever, pull back the hammer, and shoot. So this is, you know, actually a, a real rifle, or a real modern rifle, I should say. And because there was, it was a seven shot repeater, I mean, he loaded seven shots in and fired all seven shots before he had to reload it again. The guys joked that you could load it on a Sunday and shoot it all week, where you had to reload it. And this really added to the firepower of the bucktails. They carried this gun through the wilderness campaign until they were mustered out of service on May 30th, 1864. And this really, again, added to the firepower of the regiment and was really a, the best gun, you know, that, that they, they had. Matter of fact, the Spencer was President Lincoln's favorite gun. He'd go out behind the White House in those days in the park and target practice daily with that gun. Yeah, also, probably should tell you the weight of these guns. This one here is 10 pounds. It's a really solid piece of iron, to say the least. The Sharps was eight and a half pounds. And the Springfield was 10 pounds. So can you imagine carrying those around all day, you know, in your hot uniforms, marching 25 miles before you went to battle and then having to load them, shoot them, fight with them all day. A lot of times too, you had to make sure that you cleaned the barrel out of your gun maybe halfway through the battle because it would clog up with the black powder that they used. So you'd see guys dumping water down their barrel then swabbing it out now and then just to, you know, make sure that the gun would fire later in the battle. And I wanted to tell you a little bit more about Colonel Thomas Kane and why the men respected him so much. Actually, he was only five foot two inches tall. They described him as being like jockey sized, but he had this big fierce beard that would bristle when he was angry. And he was also the guy who, you know, demanded respect just by his bearing. So even though he was short in stature, the men respected him totally. Also, too, in the first battle that the Bucktails were involved in, the Battle of Drainsville in December of 1861, Thomas Kane noticed that the rebels were trying to outflank, go around the end of the Union line. And so he rallied the Bucktails and headed in the rebels' direction. And he took about two steps when all of a sudden the rebel sharpshooter shot him with a mini ball right through the face. And went in one cheek and out the other, knocked Colonel Kane down, and yet without even thinking about it, he shook his head a couple times, picked up the sword, and led the winning charge across the field. So you can see why the men were so taken with Colonel Kane. You know, he was a fierce leader who would stop at nothing. He was, you know, really an inspiration to the men. And eventually he got, he had to leave the Bucktails because he was promoted to Brigadier General and he left the Bucktails in 1862 and was bumped upstairs, as they say, and led a regiment from that point on. And, it, and another kind of interesting thing about Kane is he was sick and in a Baltimore hospital when the Battle of uh, Gettysburg broke out. So he got on his horse, horse and galloped all the way to Gettysburg to lead his men in battle. You know, he left his, basically his sick bed in order to do that, to show again you know, how fiery a guy he was. The book that I would recommend to you is a book that I wrote um, called Just the Pennsylvania Bucktails. And this book is a brief history and introduction to the Civil War Bucktails. 
and it tells you how the regiment was organized like I did earlier. It tells you about the birth of the bucktails. It tells about all the various battles they fought in. And then also it talks about the colonels that led the bucktails, the Civil War slang that the soldiers talked, you know, used. It talks more in depth about the diseases the men faced. Also, too, it talks about, again, the equipment that they carry. And then there's information here also about the other three bucktail regiments. So it's really, you know, a good brief history of the bucktails and also about, you know, the soldiers and the, all the various things that they use in battle. As I mentioned before, David Reimer and I wrote a seven novel series about two boys from Smithport who joined the Bucktails. And this is the first book in the series, Hayfoot Strawfoot, the Bucktail Recruits. And it talks about Jimmy Jewett, who's a preacher's son, and his friend Bucky Culp, who lived out in the woods with his dad. And when his dad was killed by wolves one terrible winter, Bucky went in and found Jimmy, and then they, they ran off and joined the Bucktails. And Bucky only went along because Jimmy was all fired up and didn't know one end of a rifle from another. And so Bucky went along kind of to protect them. And they have all kind of cool adventures. And again, the, the series takes you all the way through the complete history of the Bucktails, including the Shenandoah March, the Bucktails at Antietam, the Bucktails at Fredericksburg, the Bucktails at um, Gettysburg, and then, you know, towards the end of the war. So it's a good way to learn in an easy to read manner what actually the Bucktails did. The books are historical fiction, you know, which makes them easy to read, but there's also a lot of really good, great information. And the place I found the most information that I use in my books was this book here, The History of the Bucktails. And it's written by Thompson and Roche. You can find this here in the collection here at the Bradford Public Library. It's, it's in the reference section. And it tells day by day what the Bucktails did during the Civil War. So that was an invaluable resource when I was writing my books. And again, I wrote these books with David Reimer. He and I were teaching colleagues at Bradford schools. I wanted to give a tip of the cap to Dave because he put in a ton of work in these books too. Another really good book, which does the same thing as History of the Bucktails, is called The Bucktail Wildcats. And this is basically the same as this, except he adds a few more like interesting facts to make it a little less dry. It's not just history, you also you know, learn some of the folklore behind the bucktails. This was written by a gentleman named Edward A. Glover, who was a lawyer who lived over in Tioga County. And it's kind of interesting that one of my buddies at Mansfield, and I went to college there, was the nephew of this guy. And yet I never knew until later on that he actually wrote about the bucktails. And another really great book that makes a good reference book is Pennsylvania Bucktails, a photographic album. And this shows you pictures of the actual bucktails, photographs, and then gives a brief history of each one of the participants. And so this also was great because I could actually see what some of these officers looked like so I could describe them accurately in my books. And then I also learned you know, a little bit about their personality and things too. So I, I love this book. I recommend this highly. You can buy this book over to the McKean County Historical Society. I'm sure they still have some copies over there. That's one of the interesting things about studying the Bucktails was you can learn a lot of folklore and things associated with the regiment too. And one of the really fun stories about the Bucktails happened at the Battle of uh, Salt Mountain. And the Colonel of the Bucktails at that point was Colonel McNeil. And he was a man who was a banker from over in Warren. And he was elected to take over for Colonel Kane after Kane left, you know, became general and left. And the rebels had this really strong stone fort about the Bucktails on Salt Mountain. And the Bucktails were having a hard time smoking the Rebs out of there. So Colonel McNeil said, here, I'll show you how to do it. So 
and he grabbed one of the bucktail's guns and he shot at a rock, a slanted rock, before the fort in the rock. The bullet skipped off the rock and shot two rebels through the head, knocked them down, and then the rebels fled. And so again, you know, stories like that you, you learn along the way too about how courageous these guys were and, and also, you know, the tricks that they used in battle really made it really interesting. Also, too, you learn a lot of folklore about the Civil War in general. And this is one of my favorite stories. It's about the topsy-turvy doll. And the little slave girls, when they played with the doll on their own, would always, you know, have the black child that they would hold in their arms. But if the master came to, to visit them, they would turn the doll over and be holding a white doll because they thought that if the master saw them holding a white doll, he would give them a little treat. And so this was called the topsy-turvy doll. You could make it into a, a black child or just by turning over the dress, a white child. It was kind of cool. Also, too, you know, in my travels, I pick up a lot of these medicine bottles and one of these medicines actually had arsenic in it, and they kept wondering why the children kept dying. Well, they were taking medicine to kill, cure one thing, and they were actually taking arsenic, and it was killing the babies. This was called the baby killer. And this one also, you know, none of the medicine was good in those days. As a matter of fact, uh, some of the medicine had mercury in it, and if you took the medicine years later, it would affect your brain and you'd go crazy. So you didn't want to go to the doctor if you could possibly help in the Civil War. As a matter of fact, they called them the sawbones because they wanted to cut off your arm or leg if you got shot there. It also had poison for medicine. That was another, you know, kind of an interesting fact about, about what I learned is, is I, you know, learned about the bucktails and all the things that they did. And again, I think that this is interesting just because it's about soldiers from our area. Where they learn the heroics of men who grew up in, right around here, who were deer hunters and were good shots, and they turned them into sharpshooters and special forces guys that helped end the Civil War a little bit earlier than maybe it wouldn't have if they had, had not participated. Okay, thank you very much for your time, and I hope you enjoyed it.